Okay, so finally we'll talk about some of the main concerns you should watch out for when you're doing your regression discontinuity. Um, because while it seems really easy to just draw a whole bunch of lines, measure the gap, you're done, um, you do need to consider lots of things um, to make sure that that gap is valid um, and that the data that you've collected is valid. Um, so the first issue, probably the main most important issue, is that it's a very greedy method. Um, what that means is it needs a ton of data because you're throwing most of it away. Um, if, so if we go back to these pictures here, when we're doing an analysis, we have like, I think I drew this with like 3,000 dots um, total. Um, but what you're doing when you're doing this regression discontinuity stuff is you're only looking at those orange dots. And so um, you might only have 500 data points out of the 3,000 that you've collected that you care about. And so that shrinks um, your ability to measure effects in the real world. That makes really wide standard errors. That makes really uncertain estimates. And so you need to have a ton of data, um, often like seven to 10 to 12 times the amount of data that you would need for a regular uh, randomized controlled trial, which is, which is difficult. Um, this is why you often see regression discontinuity done on giant data sets. Um, so we talked at the beginning about that, um, that time zone study that was done. Um, the reason that worked is because there are millions of people that live in the country um, and millions of people that live right near uh, time zone boundaries. And so you were able to just look at the people there instead of um, the whole country. And so it worked. Or with the California um, hospitals to see um, if having a baby at 11.59 versus 12.01 mattered um, for maternal health outcomes, that worked because they have lots of people in California and lots of people were born in the years that they were looking at. And so that worked. If you were just looking at like a month, you're not going to have enough data to, to get any good causal inference out of it. And so you need lots and lots of data for this to work. Um, but lots of social programs are used on lots of people. And so if you're looking at the effectiveness of food stamps, there are millions of people who use SNAP. And so if you can get the data for SNAP eligibility, you can compare people right before and after. And so you, there's, there's lots of data in the world based on these arbitrary rules. Um, you just have to find it and, and use it, uh, but you need lots of it. It's also limited in scope. Um, so we talked a, a couple of videos ago about the fact that you're only measuring the average treatment effect for people in the bandwidth. So what you end up getting is something called the local average treatment effect instead of the total average treatment effect. And this matters for economists especially um, because in causal inference, what you care about generally the most is finding the population level average treatment effect. So the effect of a program on everybody in the population on average. Um, and so randomized control trials let you do that because you randomize who in the population is getting it. And so you can ostensibly talk about the whole population having some sort of effect. Um, when you're looking at regression discontinuity, you're not. Um, you're just looking at people in the bandwidth. And so you can't make population level claims with just a local average treatment effect. You can't say this AIG program causes everybody in the school to have eight points higher on average. Um, you can't say that. You can say people within that boundary um, between 60 and 80 or whatever your bandwidth is, those people have an effect or the program has an effect on those people. Um, and so when you're reporting these things, you do need to, to keep that in mind and have the caveat of this is limited to just these people um, and it's not a population level thing. And so um, with that, there's some hesitancy in some corners of the econometrics world that you shouldn't use this necessarily for policy, um, for making policy and for determining if a program is effective because you're just talking about a narrow section of your population, not the whole thing. Um, but the counter argument there is if you run a randomized control trial in two villages somewhere in Tanzania with uh, mosquito nets or something and you find that mosquito nets are effective, does that reflect kind of a population level treatment effect on everybody? Um, and it might not necessarily. You have issues with external uh, generalizability, um, external validity. Um, and so even these methods like diff and diff and RCTs that let you get a true population level average treatment effect, um, you still have to be careful when you're making kind of policy suggestions with those treatment effects because 
theoretically, those are still kind of local. Um, so Angrist and Pischke, the authors of the, the metrics uh, book that you have, they're early, in their earlier book called um, Mostly Harmless Econometrics, they have this important quote in there that says, essentially, all quantitative empirical results, every analysis that you do, um, all of the effects are going to be local to some extent. Even if it's a perfect RCT, it's still going to be local to the section of the population that you care about. Um, and so don't be afraid of making policy suggestions and program suggestions based on a local average treatment effect. You can still make good suggestions. So just keep, it, keep in mind that you're looking at a limited section of, of your population. But even with diff and diff and RCTs, you're still, making, you're still looking at a limited section of your population. And so it's not, um, not like everything's perfect either way. Um, so don't be afraid of local average treatment effects. Um, another thing to keep in mind um, is that regression discontinuity is very graphically oriented. Um, this is one reason it's so intuitive. People love this stuff because you can look at graphs and pretty readily um, understand how big an, an effect is. And so if you look at these graphs here, you have panel A. That's a pretty big jump there. Panel B, maybe not so much of a jump. Panel C right here, maybe there's no effect there. If you present panel A to funders for your nonprofit and say, our nonprofit boosts these blue dots by however big that gap is, that's memorable. People are going to like that. They're going to fund you. You're going to get lots of money for your nonprofit. Hooray. Um, so if you show these lines here, which one of these lines or which of these panels here show a significant effect? Um, which of these gaps is significant? A looks pretty good. B, maybe that's significant. C right here, those are pretty close together, so that's probably not significant. And so if you presented C to funders, they would probably see that and say, eh, it doesn't really do much. That's just up to chance. Um, and if you just relied on graphics here, you would give up on C. You would say, there's definitely no effect there, so stop. Um, but when you actually measure these things, if you look at the, the p-values here that I've put in the plot titles, um, the p-value for the first two is below 0 0.001, super significant. The t-score is way bigger than 2, which is kind of the, the threshold you have, the 1.96, if you remember from your stats classes. Um, but if you look at this plot here, um, it is significant. The p-value is 0 0.046, so right on the border of 0 0.05. The t-score the T statistic is 1.997, which is just barely above the 1.96 that we use as kind of the 5% threshold. Um, but technically, this is still statistically significant, even though it doesn't look like it. Um, and so relying just on graphics isn't the greatest. You should also get the numbers, find the p-values, get the actual size of this gap, um, and get the uncertainty around it with the, the confidence intervals and the, the other T statistics. Um, that's important, so don't over-rely on graphics. Um, graphics are neat, um, but seeing super clear breaks is pretty uncommon. You're going to find smaller treatment effects. You're not going to find like a 3,000 point treatment effect. That's going to be fairly obvious. Um, when you're looking just at the boundary, you're going to see a slight difference between the two groups. And so make graphs, make a ton of graphs. Um, these are great for data visualization, but also find the actual delta value and all of the statistics around it. And don't rely just on the graphics. Um, another thing to worry about is people's behavior um, around the cutoffs. If people know about the cutoff, they will often change their behavior to either get into the program or to avoid the program. Um, like when we talked about moving to opportunity, there were a whole bunch of people who did not want to be lotteried into the program that makes them move out of their, their neighborhood. They didn't want to do that. So if, if, if it was based on some sort of eligibility threshold, you might not want to get into that program, so you might fudge the numbers a little bit. Or in the case of this AIG test, um, the teacher administering the test might know that the student who scored a 74 is really good, but they were just having a bad day, and so they might fudge the number to get it to 75, so they're in the program. And so if you see manipulation with this running variable, that can cause, that can mess up how comparable your, your treatment and control groups are. You don't really have similar people anymore because you have people who are 
maybe above kind of the normal average around the threshold, lowering themselves into the group, or people way below moving themselves up. And so you can't really um, talk about comparable treatment in control groups if you have this sort of manipulation. Um, my favorite example of this manipulation here is this graph here that shows the distribution of marathon finishing times for all marathon runners um, since like the year 2000. There's like 9 million, 9.6 million observations here. And so if you see this, in theory you would think that like the, the distribution of finish times is fairly smooth, but it's not. If you look at the white lines here, this is um, at specific times. And so there's the five hour break, there's the five minute and 30 break, six hour break. And if you look over at the four hour break, there's a ton of people that try to finish under four hours. And then nobody's really trying to finish at four hours and one minute. Um, that kind of drops. And so people are purposely, they're manipulating this, this cutoff, um, not in a bad way. They're just trying to hit like a personal record. They're trying to say, I'm going to finish this marathon under four hours or under three and a half or under three. And so you can see um, lots of bunching right up at the threshold. Um, and then no bunching on the other side because nobody generally has a goal of trying to finish a marathon in three hours and three minutes. Um, you're going to try to do it in two hours and 59 minutes instead. And so what you have is you don't have smooth, a smooth distribution of your running variable here. You have um, clear manipulation where people are trying to go a little bit faster right before the threshold. Um, so there are ways to test this. Um, in your causal inference mixtape reading, um, Scott Cunningham talked about the McCrary density test, which you can run in R with this RD plot density function. Um, what this lets you do is graph the distribution of your running variable. So this could be your AIG score, this could be your income, this could be whatever, whatever assigns treatment into the program. And if there's manipulation, you'll see a graph that looks something like this, where there's lots of bunching right before the cutoff, and then um, after the cutoff, it's really low. And so that's a sign. You can see the, those confidence intervals don't overlap. Um, so that's a good sign that there was some manipulation. People are like there are more people than expected on the left hand side of the, the cutoff. Um, if you look at the no manipulation um, distribution right here, um, those confidence intervals overlap. That's fairly continuous all the way throughout. And so that's kind of a good way of checking that there's no manipulation in the running variable. People are just doing it um, continuously across that whole range. Um, another issue you have to worry about is this idea of non-compliance. Um, and we'll talk more about compliance when we talk about instrumental variables. Because um, you have groups of people who might be assigned to the treatment and then don't do the treatment. Um, we call those um, non-compliers or defiers. Um, but we have that here in regression discontinuity as well. People who are on the margin of the cutoff might not get into the program when they're supposed to, or they might get into the program when they're not supposed to. Um, we see this in real life um, with the Affordable Care Act. As that was rolled out um, back in 2010, in states that didn't expand Medicaid, you got people stuck in this weird gap um, where if you lived in a state like North Carolina, like I did when they rolled out this, this Affordable Care Act stuff, if your income was between 100% and 138% of the poverty line, then you did not qualify for subsidies and you didn't qual qualify for Medicaid. And so you were kind of stuck in the middle. And so um, it was tricky because if your income was like 136% of the poverty line, then if you could just boost that income by 2% somehow driving for Uber or doing something so that you could then qualify for the, the Obamacare um, subsidies, then you would. And so you would get some sort of manipulation trying to boost your income just a little bit to get above the poverty line so that you can then qualify for the subsidies. Um, and so like, we see this manipulation type of stuff all the time. And it's not a bad thing. It's not the people who were 136% were cheating by trying to boost their income. Um, that's kind of a logical thing that you're supposed to, that you do so that you can afford um, health insurance. Um, but it is a sign of kind of not having a clear break in um, the assignment of the program. So what you end up with is this, this thing called sharp discontinuities and fuzzy discontinuities. So sharp discontinuities is what we saw at the beginning in the first video that we did, um, where if you have this, this test score, 75, people below the 75, nobody below 75 
um, was in the program, and nobody above 75 was not in the program. It's very clear. And so that is a sharp discontinuity. It's perfect compliance. You don't have anybody um, with low scores getting into the program. But often you'll see something like this, where some people who scored above the threshold didn't participate in the program, maybe because they didn't want to, or because they weren't told that they passed the test. Um, or you might have people, if you look at the top line, um, that scored lower than 75, but still participated in the program. Um, and so if you have something like this, you have something called a fuzzy discontinuity, which is uh, imperfect compliance. You have non-compliers um, in both of those groups. And so what do you do with that? If you're trying to draw a line there, um, you're going to get a gap, but that gap's not going to be perfect because you have some people on the other side of the discontinuity that are not in the program or in the program, and it'll mess up your results. So to do that, um, you have to address this fuzzy discontinuity in a special way. Um, you use what are called instrumental, instrumental variables, and we'll talk about those in the next section of videos um, and what they actually mean. So don't worry about that. Um, you don't have to worry about fuzzy discontinuities for your um, problem set. Just know that they exist, and you just use an instrument, and that generally fixes it. Um, the instrument that you use, you don't have to find a weird instrument, um, as we'll talk about with um, instrumental variables. You have to have weird, bizarre things like rainfall. Um, with fuzzy regress and discontinuity, you can generally just use an instrument of um, which side of the cutoff people should be on, or if they should have been in the program or not. And the problem, one of the problems with fuzzy discontinuities is that you're finding, again, just the local average treatment effect, so people within that bandwidth, but you're also finding the local average treatment effect for just the compliers. And so it's a smaller slice of your local average treatment effect. You're not looking at the non-compliers. You're just looking at people who followed the instructions and who are within that bandwidth. And so the effect that you get out of a fuzzy regression discontinuity is kind of even not necessarily smaller, but has other potential biases, other potential issues with it um, than just a regular local average treatment effect. You have to worry about this double localness, um, which can be a concern.